Well, here we go, folks. Uh, everybody inside, ready to go. Uh, I'm Keith Lehigh. Uh, I'm the program chair this year for BroCon 2018, and I would like to welcome all of you to uh, lovely Washington, D.C. for, uh, for BroCon. Um, it's quite a nice crowd. We've got a pretty good diverse crowd. Um, I hope everyone's ready for an interesting conference uh, with all sorts of fascinating talks. Um, if this is your first time at BroCon, uh, I'm really happy to see you here. I'm also happy to see the rest of you as well, but it's really wonderful to have first-time folks here, uh, and I hope that you have a, a good, interesting conference and meet lots of people, make good connections, and go home inspired to do exciting things with Bro. Um, get a couple of housekeeping items out of the way here. Uh, Social media, uh, there's a little bit of confusion around the hashtag. We're using BroCon 2018 for the hashtag, so uh, tweet away things, um, mention the talks, and use that hashtag. Website, you all probably know that. That's how you got registered. Uh, but again, the agenda is there. Um, we also have wireless here at the Hyatt. Uh, it is Hyatt Meetings for the SSID, and the uh, password is just BroCon18. Uh, pretty, pretty clever there. Um, hopefully no one uh, brute forces that. Uh, also, uh, if you are into mobile apps, uh, there is a mobile app uh, that is, uh, go to your favorite mobile store, you know, uh, grab the Agenda Pop app, uh, make sure you enter in broke as the code, uh, it is not case sensitive, uh, and then log in with the email address that you used to register. Um, if you used an anonymous address, I guess you'll have to brute force that as well. So. Um, Social media stuff covered. Uh, also wanted to mention a couple of things about uh, just a few technical items. Um, bro packages. Uh, there's been a bro package manager for last year and a half. Uh, it's, uh, you know, sort of think CPAN for bro. Uh, that makes me sound old. Um, make packages. Uh, if you've got, you know, if you've got a script you're running, there is someone out there that probably wants to use the same script uh, and just hasn't had a chance to write it. Um, if your script is like not quite ready for prime time, put it out there anyway. Uh, somebody else will polish it up for you. Um, Bro is about community. Uh, this event is about having a community and the Bro Package Manager is one way to sort of build that community offline, share ideas, share things that we're doing. Um, people will be talking about packages that they've made, um, you know, things that they've done with Bro packages, uh, but I want to encourage everyone to, you know, get packages cranked out there. We've got 70 some odd packages out there now, uh, and it would be pretty fantastic to get over 100. Um, website, which is packages.bro.org, um, that is a web UI to be able to browse through packages, look at different tags, figure out what's in there. Uh, and then there's also documentation uh, once you'd like to start building your own packages. Um, they're super simple, uh, so have at it. Also like to make sure that everyone is aware that there is a 2.6 beta that is out, uh, that's been out for a couple weeks now. Uh, a lot of work has gone into this over a long period of time. Um, there will be a bunch of discussion about that, uh, but I specifically wanted to mention the broker cluster communication framework, um, which I think is going to be a pretty sort of revolutionary thing for Bro. Um, there's also a new configuration framework. Uh, Johanna is actually going to speak about that. There's a whole lot of other wonderful features in there. Um, what we'd really like is people to go out, give it a try, and then give us feedback. Um, that feedback can be sent to the Bro Dev uh, list um, or uh, if you have issues, now these days we are actually putting issues up on GitHub. Uh, for those of you who've been around the project for a while, we used to have Jira Tracker. Um, we are now using uh, GitHub. So all of the issues have been there. If you've got problems with the 2.6 beta, um, please let us know. Um, we'd like to get this move forward a little bit further, but having more people try it out and give us feedback, even feedback as simple as I ran it and it works great, uh, is helpful. Um, it's nice to know that it's working well. Uh, so, give it a whirl, uh, it works pretty well. So, this year we've got a lot of helpful sponsors, uh, a lot of people that have helped to make this conference uh, effective uh, and get it all together. Um, 
I wanted to specifically note a couple of folks here. Um, this year, the leadership team uh, asked Corelight to help out with organizing the conference. Um, and I wanted to specifically uh, mention and recognize the work that, um, that Alan and Sophia and Anna and Robin have all put into a lot of work that's gone into getting this conference up and going, regular meetings and making sure that this turned out to be successful. Um, we also partnered up with Connolly Works to do a lot of the organizing, uh, and I don't know if she's here, but I'm going to embarrass. Alexis Williams has been uh, particularly helpful. Um, I learned a lot about organizing and, and how all of this stuff gets put together, and uh, this conference would have been uh, quite terrible if Alexis had not, had not put a lot of her work into this. So if everyone could take a moment and give some applause to Alexis. So we do have a lot of sponsors. Uh, fantastically, we have a reception this evening from 5 to 6.30, and that was sponsored by Bricotta. Um, it would be really great to uh, you know, go out, get together, meet everybody, and Bricotta was nice enough to sponsor that arrangement. Um, so thanks to them for, uh, for putting forward their effort and their, uh, their support. And come out this evening and chat with all of your bro friends and, and have a drink or two. And then last but not least, I wanted to specifically point out uh, the 40 gig sponsors uh, who have put forward a lot of resources to help make this a successful conference. Um, Blue Vector, uh, Ixia, Perched.io, um, Humio, nice folks from Reservoir, the other folks are nice too. Uh, and uh, finally, last but not least, Garland Technologies. Um, all of these folks were instrumental in, in getting this conference to where it is right now. So if you could give a quick round of applause for those folks as well. Vendors are out. Um, as you're out wandering around on break, stop by and chat with them. Uh, even if you have all of the widgets and whatnot uh, that you need, um, you should stop by and chat with them because they might have ideas or other widgets that you would like. So um, make some new friends, meet some new people. So uh, this year we have a, a pretty excellent keynote, I think. Um, uh, I think this will be really interesting, it'll be stimulating, uh, people will, will have lots of, hopefully lots of ideas to walk away from. Um, this year Marcus Ranum uh, has agreed to give us a keynote. Um, so Marcus, uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, is a world-renowned expert on security system design and implementation. Um, he's a pioneer in security technology who is one of the early innovators in firewall, VPN, and intrusion detection systems. Um, he's been involved in every level of operations of a security product business from developer to founder and CEO of Network Flight Recorder, uh, and he holds numerous industry awards. Uh, I think that you all will really enjoy the keynote that Marcus has, so uh, without further ado, let's let him have his thing, and uh, thank you for uh, coming out, and I hope we all have a good conference. Uh, well, thanks for having me. Um, I did a, a talk at ISSA at the Global Conference earlier this year, and they actually asked me to do an overtly political talk about cyber war, um, which means I won't ever have to talk for ISSA again. Um, I, I thought that I would try to talk about kind of broad industry issues and just bore the crap out of you. Um, but then I remembered I have a lot of half-baked ideas from back in the 90s when I was running Network Flight Recorder and subsequently. And so what I thought I would do is brain dump a bunch of stuff at you that are um, kind of leftover half-thoughts from uh, working on detection for some period of time. Um, first off, one of the things that consistently surprises me is how few people actually have any clue what's going on on their network. So if you're here, congratulations, you're gonna be among the survivors. Um, or, or you're on the, on the other side and you're just, you're just trying to blend in. Um, you know, we have to be able to look at stuff. And, and consistently, one of the things that has always shocked me about today's environment, which is full of malware, and, and if, you, if you listen to the totalitarians in Washington, it's, it's full of uh, you know, governments sneaking around trying to get at all of our precious vital fluids. Um, 
you have to look in order to find this stuff. And I find it amazing that there are people going, you know, we have all these spies all over the place. Um, and then they're actually not really looking for spies. If you actually believe you have spies, you should be all using Bro or something like it, and you should be looking at this stuff. And fairly consistently, when I talk to executives and I say, you really need to up your game pretty dramatically in terms of the quality of the telemetry that you're bringing back from your network, they usually go, you know, it just works. And I go, no, this isn't a question of works. This is a question of actually understanding what you've built and how it's being used. And, and nobody seems to want to do that. So right now, this is kind of where we are. And, and I thought about, as I was writing these slides, I thought about turning this into a talk in which I was going to complain about DevOps and, and uh, the Internet of bad, Internet of Things. Um, I'll just you know. So the Internet of Things. You know, the S in Internet in IoT stands for security. Um, anyway, so this is this is random ideas, and I apologize if I haven't been keeping up with what's going on in Bro. One of the weird things that has happened about security since I started in the industry when I was a young pup is it's gotten so big that now we have subspecialties within security. There was a period of time where kind of everybody knew everything that there was to know because we really hadn't figured very much out yet. And now you can have people who just focus on this thing or just focus on that thing. And it, it's too big of a problem, which I think is a really bad sign, frankly. Right? When you get to the point where generalists, uh, um, Dan Gear said something about this the other day. The industry has gotten so big that the time has passed where you would get people who understood the totality of the field, right? It, that's gone. Nobody like that is going to come along because there's so much that you're not going to have another Dan Gear because he kind of helped create all of this, and so he saw it all as it was being created. Um, and nobody's going to come along and try to become the historian of computer security for another 100 years or so. Someday that will happen. It'll be kind of interesting. Think about that, right? When you read books like, um, um, you, you read books like uh, Siddhartha Mukherjee's, you know, the, the Emperor of All Maladies, which is a fantastic account of humanity's encounters with cancer and how we've dealt with cancer, you go, wow, this is fascinating. This is, this is science. This is how it happens. And then I realized, you know, 100 years from now, somebody's going to be writing that kind of stuff about computer security. And some of the people in this room are going to show up as characters in there. Just remember that and try not to be one of the villains. When, um, <laughs> when the story's written, you want to be written up as one of the good guys, um, which is cool. So anyway, I haven't been keeping up with things. Um, and this is going to be a little bit disorganized because I'm trying to fit a lot of ideas that don't really hang together. Well, they do kind of hang together. I'm going to be trying to fit them all into one talk, and it's going to feel like a little bit of, it felt like a bit of a grab bag as I wrote it. But the, the idea that everything hangs around is this notion of what is abnormal. We all talk about that. In fact, one of the ways you can always tell that you're talking to a computer security noob is they say, I want to find abnormal traffic. <laughs> OK. <laughs> you know, I, that sounds great. You know, I, I would like that, too. <laughs> um, you know, I would like to be able to also snap my fingers and avoid all of the security lines at airports, but that's not going to happen, right? So ultimately, we have this weird paradox, because what we are trying to do is detect abnormal, but you can't detect abnormal because you don't know what it is. So how do you detect something when you don't know what it is? It turns out it's actually pretty easy. Um, what you do is you take everything you see, and then you subtract everything that you think is normal, and then what's left is abnormal. That's the algorithm for detecting abnormal. I believe it's the only algorithm for detecting abnormal. I'll argue that a signature-based IDS, and by the way, when, when marketing people say signature-based IDS, they're saying it's a bad thing. I actually say signature-based IDS, I mean it's a good thing. Actually, let me segue into that for just a second. What is a signature? A signature is a pattern or a sequence of events that gets compiled into a matching rule, and then you attach a diagnosis to it, right? So when someone says, I have a signature-based IDS, what they're saying is they're saying, when I see, and when I say pattern, I am not talking regexes, okay? Regexes are way too simple for what we're talking about. It's a pattern, though. It's a sequence of events in, in time. And when we see that sequence of events occur, we say, oh, that's this particular attack. 
That's how you do diagnosis. It is, in fact, the only way to establish an epistemology. It's an expert system. It's, you're basically saying experts have identified that when this pattern happens, that's what's going on. This is how we humans gain and manipulate knowledge. The alternative is an ignorant system, which you can basically say, which we're going to get to that in a second. You can basically say something's going on and I don't know what it is. Be very afraid. That's all. You, actually, the be very afraid isn't even a sure thing. Something's going on and I don't know what it is. You have to figure it out. So when I see pattern, when I used to see people saying signature-based IDS are terrible, I'd go, well, you know, what alternative do you actually want? Do you want something that creates you 10 times as much work because you have to figure out what is going on? Or would you like an IDS that says, I see this particular attack? Here's what, in fact, here's a CVE and here's a link for what you should do about it. That's fantastic, all right? Okay, so here's how you figure out what's abnormal. You have to figure out what's normal. And, and that's the thread that I think is going to go through everything I'm going to talk about, is this whole process of how you differentiate normal from abnormal. Or well, actually, you don't have to worry about differentiating, uh, differentiating abnormal. That falls out as part of defining normal, right? So consequently, you don't want to try, you, you can't detect abnormal traffic by training, training an artificial intelligence or something or other to detect abnormal. What you can do is you can train an artificial intelligence or something to detect normal, and then you can do that subtraction, and that's not so bad, right? And then the other part of it is how do you teach the, your, your thingamajig, whatever you want to call it, um, healthy skepticism? Because since we're dealing with a fuzzy, vague thing, you can't say for sure that something is abnormal. You can say for sure that it's not what I recognize as normal, but then everything else is kind of, you know, it's in this gray area, and that brings up the next thing. This is the, this is the algorithm for computer security. This is how, as far as I can tell, all computer security can get crushed down into this workflow. Um, I've simplified it and simplified it over the years. Um, various times when I've tried to explain this, I've pointed out, that, or I, I've contextualized this as an algorithm that you could use if you were, let's say, um, a lieutenant, and your responsibility was to provide security for a party, and you had a sergeant and a private, and the private is not very smart. So the sergeant isn't either, but, you know, anyway, they're more experienced anyway. And so your algorithm is basically this. You say, private, if anyone comes by, check and see if they're on the shoot on site list. And if they're on the shoot on site list, shoot them. And if they're, if they're on the admit list, admit them. And if you're not sure, ask the sergeant. So that's the algorithm right here, right? So things come into the system. And if, they, if you've got a rule for it, then you know something about it. By definition, right? That right there, there's your epistemology. If you have a rule for something, you know something about it, that means you can do something with it. So then you do something with it. If you don't know what to do with it, then it must be abnormal. So there's your abnormal detector right there. Your abnormal detector is I don't have a rule for it. Now, you're probably thinking that there's a problem with this, which is if you're saying you're going to try to enumerate all the possible states of the system in order to define normal, yes, that's what I'm saying. Sorry. That's the part that sucks. But if you think about it, what, we're, what we've been doing with antivirus for the last 30 years is trying to enumerate what abnormal runtime looks like. What we could be doing is enumerating what a normal runtime looks like. That's called a whitelist, and you have to be careful with those. But, but there's some things that you can do here. So this is, this is, basically, this is basically the algorithm as I, as I understand it. The reason that's important or interesting is if we design our workflow correctly, then we can figure out which parts of the process are simple and which parts of the process are hard, and we can try to figure out where we can automate or where we cannot automate, right? And that's where you can plug in your artificial intelligence fairy dust and it will, or your big data or whatever you want to call it, your, your, your highly hyped technology du jour, um, and, you know, it's going to help. By the way, I am... Um, uh, 
machine intelligence, Bayesian, wub wub, unicorn, fairy dust, blockchain, AI is a trademark that I, I, I'm <laughs> claiming. So don't any of you start marketing for that. Um, but so this is what it looks like, right? If you, can, if you can identify your entire workflow by which knowledge is gained about a thing, and you can say, well, here's where, here's where the new categorization happens. And that's actually a fairly simple problem to, for teaching some kind of a neural network or whatever it is that you want to call it. Right? Now, I'm not an AI skeptic. I've been working with some degree of AI stuff since the late 80s. And I actually think it's, a very, it's, a, it, it's what brains do. We just do it very much better. Um, so I'm not trying to dismiss AI. I have a weird thing in my head about AI, which is that I tend to see artificial intelligence algorithms as translatable back and forth between some very primitive operations. So when I hear people talking about this particular type of a neural network or whatever, I just, I just go, okay, it's just a matrix of Bayesian classifiers, have fun, right? To me, all of this is just a way of encoding probability and once you think about it as a way of encoding probability and making decisions based on the likelihood of future probability based on past probabilities, you're talking Bayesianism, and that's not really complicated stuff. And then I understand it, and then I'm happy. Okay, so machine learning, the simplest for, form of machine learning for doing this kind of thing is a process automation framework that doesn't forget what you told it. So imagine if our private, who's doing security for the party, I just called him dumb, which wasn't very cool. Um, but let's imagine that the private isn't very smart, but they have a fantastic memory. They're going to be able to fill that role without being smart. Because the sergeant is going to update their knowledge base, and then they're just going to ruthlessly execute the knowledge base along with a few of your guests. Um, they're just going to they're just going to crank through that knowledge base, right? The, the intelligence. So if you think about it, what we have here is a distributed knowledge base in which the sergeant is the source of knowledge and the private is the execution engine. And if you can capture the sergeant's decision making, you can propagate the sergeant's decision making across an infinite number of privates very easily. And that's what antivirus technologies do. And when I think about antivirus, I, I was going to say whitelisting antivirus. But right, all, all the uh, antivirus product is a blacklist. It's all the stuff in your runtime that you shouldn't run. You can also have a whitelist. An app store is a kind of a whitelist. It's all the stuff that is, in principle, OK to run. So you can think about, all, you can think about whitelists and blacklists as inverts to each other, which means that you can leverage them into between normal and abnormal. Right? So that which is on the black list is abnormal. Well, actually, that's which is on the gray list, which is the list that is the stuff we don't know anything about. That's the stuff we ask the sergeant about. That's the stuff that's abnormal. That's one of the reasons why being a sergeant is difficult, because the sergeant always gets asked the incredibly abnormal stuff. Right? I mean, I don't know if, you, if any of you in here have been NCOs at any point in your life, but you know, if you have, that the sergeants are always the one where somebody comes and says, I've got a deuce and a half in a tree, how do I get it down? And you go, oh, well, of course, you get it down using the standard get the deuce and a half out of the tree procedure, <laughs> which, is, which is what? I don't know. I, I haven't invented that one yet. All right, so let's look a little bit more at what constitutes abnormal, right? Abnormal is when the system enters a state that's never been seen before. I can't be sure that states that have never been seen before are all of the abnormal states, but I can be sure that if a state that never, has never been seen before is abnormal, right? So there could be more abnormal states that we haven't seen, but the first time you see something that you've never seen before, it's abnormal to you, at least. And so in the context of malware detection or systems, system security, I think we can call something that's never been seen before as abnormal. And then those of you who, who know me know I've been working on never before seen anomaly detection for a long time. The, the funny thing about it was it was actually a joke. Um, I was trying to talk to somebody about anomaly detection, and I said the only anomaly detection algorithm that really always works is, well, I've never seen that before, so it's an anomaly. And then I thought about it, and I thought, that was actually unintentionally kind of smart. The first time you see an elephant in a tutu, it's going to surprise you. 
after you've seen dozens of elephants in tutus, you're just going to start, you know, you're going to go, well, the other one wore it better or, or whatever, <laughs> right? Um, and if you work at elephantsintutus.com, that, that's your customer base. You, you, they are completely normal. And actually, the elephant that's not in a tutu is unusual to you. Um, there's probably something profound hidden in there, but I, I, can't, I, can't, I can't dig it out. But I think we can leverage this out into you know, network security analysis. So what we're trying to do is any place where we can amplify what we think is unusual, that's what anomaly detection is. Right? And, we're, and then we're down to algorithms. And, and uh, I'd you know, be happy to argue with this with, with people over over beer indefinitely and incessantly, but I really think that this is the only kind of anomaly detection algorithm that works, is this, this kind of subtracting what you've seen before from, from what's happening. Um, that, that's what anomaly detection is. So let's talk about some techniques. I don't know a word for this, so I call it transforms. <clears throat> the idea is you can't figure out everything about the message, so what you do is you look at the, the shape of the message. Oh, I should mention something. NBS, never before seen anomaly detection. I wrote a tool called NBS back in 2000 or thereabout. Um, and NBS was a simple filter for doing never before seen anomaly detection. If you want a copy of NBS, it's on my website. The source code's there. You'll need the old Sleepy Cat BSD DB library in order to build it. But it'd be pretty easy to port it to DBM. But the whole idea of NBS was to act as a filter on a stream of anything. NBS works on everything is a string, a single string ended with a new line, right? So anything you shove at NBS, it will look in its little database very quickly. It'll look in its little database, and if it's never seen that thing before, it comes out the other side. If it has seen it before, it just increments a count in the database and, and throws it away. Or depending on what you've chosen, you can also have it keep a couple of instances of that thing, you can keep records, and you know, there's a bunch of different stuff. So you could basically point NBS at a line of syslog data, an input of syslog data, and it'll filter out all the stuff that you've seen before. Of course, that's not going to work on syslog data, because syslog data is all changing because we put the timestamp at the beginning of the line. But if we pulled some pieces out of syslog data, if we pulled interesting pieces out of syslog data, then you, you know, the time isn't particularly interesting. Then you can do an, an NBS on the data as it flows through, and suddenly you can start looking for new shapes in syslog, uh, or new literal strings in syslog. So that turned out not to work too badly. It worked pretty well. Um, but I was trying to think, how can we make it so that it is less specific about the content, and that's where I came up with this idea of transform. So we're trying to look at the shapes of messages, not the messages themselves. Another way of putting it is that a message consists of a bunch of text fields stuck together on a line. And some of those fields are variant fields, and some of those fields are invariant fields. So for example, uh, 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 SU colon bad SU MJR TTY P5, right? MJR and TTYP5 are highly variable fields, whereas SU, bad SU versus SU are also variable fields, but they're not very variable fields. And what that gives you right there is the framework that your neural network can chew, or your array of Bayesian classifiers can chew on. Because I just gave you the fact that there's different probabilities that you're going to see MJR versus root, and there's different probabilities that you're going to see bad SU versus SU. And you're, there's going to be different probabilities that you're going to see different TTYs. So what you could do is you could do never before seen on SU users, and then the first time that Fred does an SU, it's going to pop out the other side, but that Bob, Joe, and, and root, or whoever your normal users are that do SU, aren't going to pop out because it's already seen them before. Right? So that's how that does that. So we can start to use the shapes of the messages. What does this look like? Um, I decided to just translate it into a pseudo sprintf string. And the reason was because I was doing this as part of a research project uh, for a consulting client. And we were trying to ingest system logs very quickly. And I thought, well, what if I just automatically generate sprintf strings? and then just run this stuff through a C compiler, and then pull out the fields that I want, 
just using C code. And the reason that I did this is because we were dealing with a really large amount of log data that was coming at us very fast. And uh, it was kind of funny because we had a sales guy from ArcSight come in and I uh, apologize if anybody from ArcSight's in the room here. Um, I'm not gonna dish on ArcSight, but it was, it was a sales rep from ArcSight, so that's the way this story goes. Um, and the sales rep from ArcSight was bragging about how they could handle something like 50,000 lines per second. And of course, I was doing all this stuff using a hand-coded parser in C, and I was handling 6.5 million lines per second on a processor that was much smaller than what they were trying to run ArcSight on. And of course, I blew the guy off. I thought, what, 50,000 lines per second? My iPhone can handle that. And the guy was kind of horrified. Um, and then apparently he you know, went back and cried to some of his other uh, pre-sale support consultants and they said, oh, that's just Marcus. Um, but it, it, it is. Anyway, so, so what you do now is you take the transform and then you run the never before seen algorithm on the transform. So in principle, what you're gonna get is you're gonna get shapes of data that you've never seen before. This is pretty cool. It actually works. Um, I did an experiment in 2007, I think it was, Abe Singer invited me to come hang out at San Diego Supercomputer Center, and I signed some NDAs, and I got complete access to a, a thousand plus Spark processors and all of SDSC's logs, which are pretty amazing. Um, in those days, it was amazing. It was almost a terabyte of logs. And of course, nowadays, there's people who have that, but this was, 10 years ago. Um, and so this is a version, uh, a chart of transforms of log shapes in all of SDSC's logs that I had time to run through my, my transform generator. And I thought, oh, that's kind of interesting. What does it tell me? I have, well, at the time, I had no idea. I since figured out what it is. Does anybody want to take a guess? I'll tell you, it's pretty stupid. This is a Linux release detector. Because every time they did a major Linux release, there were a whole bunch of new syslog shapes that showed up. They didn't all log immediately, so there would always be like a little build bump. Um, now, here's, a, here's an example of the problems of epistemology that you get with log data. You, you can detect this, but figuring out what it means still took me two days. So it took me no time at all to detect it. And it took me the rest of my summer vacation to figure out what it meant, and, and a lot of tequila down in, in Tijuana. Okay, so um, another thing that falls from this is semantic clustering. Semantic clustering is, is kind of a big thing. Uh, I think semantic clustering is pretty cool. Um, if you work for Palantir, you, you, know, you make all the money because of semantic clustering is pretty cool. It's, it's, not, a, it's not a new field. What Palantir does particularly well is that they're hitting, they're hitting this beautiful sweet spot between programmability, nice graphics, or kind of nice graphics, and semantic clustering, and basically automated network building. Those are cool things to think about. If you can, I don't know if anyone is hooking Bro into Palantir, but that would be a, a, another way of making all the money. Um, how do you connect the dots between two events? Well, the way, the way you collect it, connect the dots between two events is based on the probability that those two events are related using some external epistemology. So if, if you know, um, let me use an example. Let's say I'm using Palantir to try to detect uh, who is selling people drugs, right? Well, what you do is you identify uh, an algorithm that indicates an underlying pattern for drug purchases, and then you scrub that pattern across all of your data. This is just intrusion detection applied as a clustering algorithm instead of as a, as a malware detection or something like that. So you got a couple of different ways that you can do your semantic clustering. One is you can use you know, your cloud-based neural network, blah, 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 whatever the heck it is. Or the other is simple old school where you extract tokens and then you score matches based on commonality of tokens. And now your technology is ad addition, which is pretty simple. It's a lot simpler than artificial intelligence. 
it, it is the same thing in my mind because you're, you're just using different algorithms to accomplish the same kind of detection. So let me talk about that. This is a, another thing that um, got developed shortly after um, uh, Never Before Seen. So Never Before Seen worked. And I thought, well, I really need to be able to run a lot of never before seen anomaly detectors. So what I really need is I need a thing that keeps lots of never before seen anomaly detectors going in parallel simultaneously. And then I want to be able to write, essentially write scripts so that I can say, use the output from this never before seen anomaly detector as input into this other never before seen anomaly detector. And it gets complicated, but it's not too difficult, right? And so you basically create a matrix about the intersections of common things. Let's say a, a simple example of a matrix might be um, MAC address to DHCP requested IP addresses. So every time you see a, a MAC address, you create a node at the intersection between the MAC address and the IP address that it gets given. So a more or less correctly functioning DHCP server should cluster fairly tightly by MAC address, right? or your DHCP server's getting rebooted a lot would be something that you might be able to learn from that. And so you maintain scores at the intersections. This is essentially the stupidest neural network that you've ever seen. Instead of using Bayesian math, it's just using addition and it's, it's forcing you to do the Bayesian stuff on the back end by looking at it. So here's what this could look like. And, um, you know, this is all working code. If you want it, you can have it. Uh, it's, on, it's on my website. So what we do is we say if we see, um, it, so the, the system ingests a kind of a pseudo XML. Uh, pseudo XML is something that looks like XML, but it didn't worry about making it a really good markup. Uh, the only reason pseudo XML existed was to avoid having to answer the question, why didn't you use XML? Because um, I didn't want to have an XML parser perched on top of this tiny little piece of code. Um, Anyway, so, so everything gets turned into something that kind of looks like a tag, and then you've got a variety of different options, like starts with, contains, is, is equal to, um, stuff like that. And then, so this would go, insert it into DNSA, bump it, bump it 500 points. And then you can say anything that goes over a certain number of points, do something with it. Now, DNSA is the name of one of the matrices. You can also insert fields into DNSA. So if I have strings A stir, B stir, C stir, whatever they are, I could say insert A stir, B stir, C stir into DNSA, and then DNSA then becomes a matrix of the intersection points of those different values extracted out of fields from the logs. So this is the connectivity piece. This is the clustering right here. And I, I don't know what exactly something like Palantir does inside, but it's got to be something like this. They're probably using fancier math because they hire smart people to do that kind of thing. So here's what some scores look like. Scoring systems turn out to be remarkably powerful. Right? That's, that's what we're doing all the time when we're looking at this stuff. We look at something, we say this looks unusual. What we're almost always doing is looking at the accumulated output of something and saying it looks unusual because it's going way up. Right. So here's what the configuration for DNSA looks like. Um, the alert channel is just a, a, a file uh, where to stick things. Uh, the recipient is the uh, alert name that gets preceded on everything. Warn at 1,000, alert at 5,000. Um, that's pretty straightforward. Where does the database go? How often does it rotate? There's some stuff like that. So you're basically building a, a score that has a time window built into it and it rotates stuff out. And then these are the key fields. That's whatever gets inserted from our pseudo XML record. We're just gonna automatically stuff that in there. Um, and then you can do fingerprints of things. So you know, looking for where the source exactly matches authentication, you stick it in login and you bump it. Um, I don't remember what the event ID is. This is some, some Windows login thingamajig or, or other that I, I don't remember, but it gets bumped based on, on specific stuff that I guess is either good or bad. I don't remember. This, this rule I, I stole from Ron, uh, Ron Dilley. Um, anyway, so <clears throat> you can do a lot with that. Then you get into hysteresis, which is another fun, uh, another fun algorithm. Hysteresis is where you try to figure out how to keep things at approximately zero. And then what you do is you monitor the number of times things go above or below the line. 
This equates to a runs test for randomness, by the way, right? Now you can do all kinds of complex algorithms to figure out whether something is random, but runs test works extremely well and they only require uh, basic subtraction or addition. So if you get a whole bunch of random data, you can do chi-square, you can do all kinds of stuff like that. But what you do with a runs test is you take the average, and then every time a number comes in above the average, you add one. Every time a number comes in below the average, you subtract one. If your numbers are fluctuating around the average, your score is going to tend to be zero. If your numbers tend to go high, it means that things are moving up away from the average over time. And if things go low, it means that things are moving down below the average over time. So that's how you can detect change in the direction or of a trend using simple addition and subtraction without having to, to um, do chi-square or anything involving real math. You're probably thinking, Marcus is allergic to real math. That's what's going on. And, and you'd be right. I break out into hives all over my body when I even think about math. You should see what I look like under my shirt right now. But anyway, so... <clears throat> If you want to do hysteresis on something like logins, when you see a failure, you add 10. When you see an attempt start, you add 1. When you see an attempt succeed, you subtract 1. It should tend to be pretty much normal, but if you get a bunch of bad login attempts, 10, 20, 40, 60, 80, 100, boom, bang, it hits the top of your whatever. And by the way, how do you tune this system? How do you tune any kind of detection? The, the, the way is very simple. You turn it on, you turn, the, you turn the gain all the way over to the right until you get feedback, and then you back off a little bit. That's it. Right. Fancy math necessary. No neural networks necessary. Right. Again, you turn the amplitude until it starts to be annoying, and then you turn it back until it stops being annoying, and it will work. That's how everybody's tuned all of their intrusion detection systems for a very long time. Right. So think about that. Right. So the long-term value of a normally behaving host should tend to be around zero, but ones that are misbehaving should tend to go slowly up. Um, so we implemented this, and uh, uh, Ron comes into the office where I was working on it and says, uh, there's a bug in your code someplace. And I went, probably. Uh, but, <laughs> but we started looking at it, and he, it turned out that there was one matrix where this one particular score kept going way up, and he concluded that I was probably misparsing some data and just assigning matches that shouldn't happen. But it turned out that actually, no, there was, there was one thing that was happening, a tremendous amount that shouldn't be, and it involved the addition of new shapes of DNS entries into the DNS request logs. And it turns out that we had found Configure way ahead of the industry. It was about two months before, three months before, people first started finding and publishing about fast-fluxing DNS. Well, we had, um, we had a reservation at this really great uh, Thai restaurant in Thousand Oaks in about a half an hour. And we had the decision to make of either trying to run down what was going on on this machine or go have some yummy, yummy Thai food. So we re-imaged the machine and went and had some yummy, yummy Thai food. And that was how we found and ignored Configur um, months, before anyone, months before anybody else. Um, so anyway, the thing that's great, and the reason I'd like to urge you to look into using scoring systems, is because they have a confidence interval built right into it. As long as you use kind of approximately the same ballpark for the values that you put into your scores, then you're going to know what's more or less significant based on the size of the score. So if you're using 100 or 10 or, or, or 50 as the kinds of scores that you assign to things, and then suddenly you've got this World of Warcraft boss-like thing that comes in with a million points, you know that there's, that there's something really unusual happening there. Now, if you've got most of your tables using numbers from 1 to 10, and then another one's using 1 to a million, obviously you're going to have a, an impedance mismatch between the, the scores. So just don't do that, right? But the point is, as long as you're a little bit disciplined with how you assign your weightings, your scoring systems are going to work, and they're going to work very well. And so the likelihood is, is tied to the score, right? And I guarantee you if something comes in. Like the, the, this DNS thing that we had, 
it was coming in with a score about 300,000 and everything else was coming in with scores in the 100 or 200 range, it wasn't hard to see that as an anomaly. Anyway, so hopefully I got you a little bit psyched with the idea of looking at scoring, at scoring systems. I think scoring systems are fantastic and it is my opinion that we could argue about is that expert systems and artificial intelligence are basically scoring systems. They're just, they're just a different metaphor for how the numbers are processed and they're using Bayesian math because it's really complicated and you get to integrate things over distance as opposed to just addition. And I, I, did I mention I hate math? Um, addition works really well. But another thing that is really fun about scoring systems is when you build a scoring system that works and you go up against the AI guys, you know, the AI guys are going, all right, we can ingest 10,000 lines per, per minute <laughs> or whatever the, whatever the speed of the AI classifier is, and you, you will be able to utterly blow them out of the water with the same accuracy with a well-tuned scoring system. Okay, so let's talk about some other stuff. This, again, is another approach to this metaphor of scoring things in, in, in knowledge space. Consider all the events on your network to be event nodes. I don't, know, I don't know the term for them, but an event node is a thing that you measure about stuff. Okay, let's, let's use that as a definition for an event node. So, so you're measuring things about stuff in time. By definition, you're measuring them in time. So it could be application states, it could be, you know, whatever. But this is what I meant when I said matching rules for signatures, okay? So your basic matching rule might be, is this regex in this string? That's not a very powerful, um, not a very, what's the right word? It's not a very uh, literate language for describing events in your knowledge space. But if you can imagine having an event description language that allowed you to say, if this machine, if any machine is in this particular state and you've got a, a, a network connection that's in this other state and then you've got inside the network connection, you've got this particular string and the source is unknown or the source is untrusted, right? It's in the zone of untrusted IP address, or it's not, not in the trusted zone of IP addresses. So you can build this kind of descriptive thing. Then you could build signatures that are extremely powerful and extremely flexible. And that's where I think a lot of this kind of stuff has got to, has got to go. Um, and I think it's where we're, we wind up going. Now, what's happening with the AI unicorn cloud fairy dust is basically you collect as many of these states as you possibly can and then you build training sets that you think are normal, I'll get to that, and then you build training sets that you know are bad, and then you train the artificial intelligence, and then stuff comes out the other side, right? Um, so there's nothing wrong with that. You think of everything as a sequence of event nodes. Now, where do you go from this? Sequences of event nodes will sometimes be linear, sometimes they won't, right? Sometimes they're gonna be in order, sometimes they're gonna be out of order, sometimes they're gonna be complex. Um, sometimes they're gonna involve one system, sometimes they're gonna involve multiple systems. If you've got the same event node, you can rewrite them as a finite state automaton. You can build a tree. And if you can build a tree, you now have a Bayesian tree classifier, right? Because each of the nodes, as you go through your finite state automaton, each of the transitions has a probability of going from one transition to the next. So you've got a Bayesian tree classifier. You don't, or, or a Markov chain, right? If you think about it uh, this way, a Markov chain is a way of turning a Bayesian classifier into a multi-way Bayesian classifier or as a tree. I, that, that probably all sounded completely incoherent. I, I have to admit, I was thinking about trying to pull a Jacques Derrida on you guys and get up here and just start going blah, 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 and, and talking marketing buzzwords and trying to sound as if I was holding a coherent narrative. Um, but that would be actually more work than giving a talk. Um, uh, oh, what's his name? Oh, shoot. Oh, anyway, there, there's that, that comedian, that, that uh, Reggie Watts, right? He's amazing at that kind of stuff. I don't know if you've seen any of the stuff he does, but he'll get up and he'll give, he'll give a talk where he's just using language that sounds like actual language, but isn't. Anyway, so here's an example of what I mean by clustering things into a finite state automaton, 
All right, so you get this particular thing, and then 95%, 98% of the time a root shell happens, 2% of the time. Um, by the way, I apologize for using these particular colors uh, for any of you who are colorblind. I literally did not think about that until this morning when I went, ah, oh, too late to change it now. Um, so, so you can build these kinds of transitions, and then you can collect the probability that you go from one state to the other, and then you can match when things don't happen. So what do I mean? Watch this. Here's how we detect abnormal states, entering into a new, new, new abnormal state. Let's say we've got user nobody starts a shell. That's never happened before. We don't know. The, we have to recompute our probability. It's not hard. And if you compare the difficulty of doing this to, to say, a neural network, <laughs> It's night and day, right? Because all we're doing, we, you only have to recalculate the probability distribution at a node where you split the node by adding a new member to it. And if you think about it computationally, this is ridiculously easy to do, right? It's just a bunch of pointers. You could probably do this in SQL, but it would be a little slow. It'd probably still be faster than a neural network. Um, and you know it trains itself instantly, right? So you just recompute your probabilities. You found a new a new branch that should be uh, FSA, not FSM. Praise be him. Um, anyway, <clears throat> anytime a system enters a state that it's never been seen in before, that's your anomaly, right? So right here, this is an anomaly detection. Anytime a user who has never started a shell before starts a shell before, the probability that it's unusual is going to be very high. That goes right back to never before seen anomaly detection. This is kind of, what do we call it? Never before seen state detection, right? Kind of cool. I wanted to build this into Overwatch because it would actually be pretty straightforward. All you have to do is take your inputs that you've parsed into atoms and then you just string them together based on matching atoms and then you build a probability tree as you build this finite state automaton, and then you start logging every time new branches get added to the tree. And then you, and the thing that's fun about that, if you think about where this is going, I can actually diagnose the tree from left to right, which means as I identify a new node that I've added in the tree, I already know what it's relevant to. So if I were to call this particular clustering my SSH user identifier cluster, I've applied a knowledge specification that as I match stuff left to right, I can now generate an error and I can say new SSH user, right? So I'm conveying more information about my anomaly detection as I go further, as I put more data into it, my anomaly detection becomes more and more evocative of what information the underlying stuff is that I'm looking at. This could be really good stuff. So if you think about it, the inputs into the, um, a tool like Overwatch or any kind of scoring system, uh, you could do this with uh, Bob Braden and Annette Deshaun's NN stat from 1970, 1979 as well, right? So the intersection, adding a new intersection is essentially adding a new state into your state chart because you had to somehow get to the point where you were going to add this new intersection of events. That means that things had to happen. So I actually built a never before seen anomaly detection option into Overwatch. That's how we detected, uh, um, we detected the DNS stuff, and that worked. Now, uh, I'm almost done, I swear. Um, for production systems, how many states exist in the system? We don't know, but can they be enumerated and whitelisted? One of the other questions is, can we actually list all the good states? Because if we can list the good states, then we can subtract all the states from all the good states, or sorry, subtract all the good states from all the states, and then all the bad states are gonna fall out the other side. Right? So we get back to the question I asked at the beginning of the talk. Now, here's a way of doing that, and that's using a goat. Um, I've used goats a couple times, and it works really well. I, I came up with this term, I, I don't know of a better one, but, but so a goat is a system that behaves normally. It becomes your definition of normal and then you subtract it from what's going on. So the way, the way you build a goat is you take a default Windows install or default iPhone or whatever it is that you want and you put that on and you basically use it as an automatic whitelist generator. You don't do anything with it except let it 
you know, pull down Adobe Flash patches automatically or update Yelp every two seconds or whatever, whatever, it, whatever your goat normally does. Your goat should not be doing what a user does unless you're absolutely sure that your goat user is a really good user who doesn't misbehave. As long as your user does only good stuff, you could actually have a goat with a user on it. Um, and then you just monitor what the goat does. And so then you use that as a model of OK, and you train your AI with your goat. So you could train your AI with the DEF CON malware traffic, which is pretty bits been done. Uh, but more interestingly is you train your network with your goat, and then you basically have your goat is your, is your, is your private. And you've got the sergeant watching the private and, doing, and, and then just keeping a logbook of all the weird things that privates do. So the goat is the automatic whitelist generator, or it's your state tree branch generator, if you want to think about it that way. And then you look at the shapes of the data that's going into and out of the goat. You could look at interpacket transmit times. You could, look at, uh, you could look at selected strings. You could look at just strings that the client sends to the server. That would be interesting. There's all kinds of different things that you can look at from the goat. You could look at DNS. You could, I, I don't know all the things that you could look at from the goat. So back to the point I made earlier about that there's this kind of knowledge sphere that you're sampling. Whatever you're sampling is what you want to sample from the goat. And then you just keep adding new things that you sample and using them to train the AI as far as what constitutes normal. right? And you can do this, and it works really, really well. Uh, we did this at one organization where they had about 1,500 websites. And all we did is we spun, so they had 1,500 websites, and the way that they would do things is they'd have a standard VM. And if you wanted to, if you wanted to, if a marketing team for some particular project wanted to have a website for such and such, they would just spin up the standard VM and give it to the marketing team and say, it's yours now, go break it. And the marketing people would go and screw stuff up. So the security team, we, we asked for a goat. We asked the, the administrators to give us a VM that we could use for security stuff, and we didn't do anything with it. We just collected all the stuff that Apache and all the stuff that was installed in the normal, normal system image usually did through the SE Linux logging facility. We collected a uh, tremendous amount of information about what system calls occurred in what sequence, and we essentially whitelisted all the system calls on a normally running machine. And then we started looking for the opposite on all of the edge websites. And it worked fantastically well, because the people who just ran a normal website never had any problems. And the people who got owned started doing all kinds of unusual stuff, and it just came flying out the other side. That works really well. But think about this as another metaphor for that black, black white, gray list process thing. It's just some of it's statistical and some of it's not. Um, and you know, I guess the question we want to ask is, at what point do we want to use a tool like Bro to whitelist network traffic, all network traffic. So anyway, um, that's what I had to say. It's just a whole bunch of stuff. Feel free to use any of these ideas. They may help. They may not. Uh, maybe I've given you a useful perspective on artificial intelligence. Maybe I've cured you of your love for artificial intelligence. If so, that would be a, that would be a significant accomplishment. Um, don't get me started on DevOps next. But. Um, <laughs> Anyway, code for this stuff is available on my website if you want it. Uh, there's a note I will ma mention, right? There's a, there's a problem with the data model of Overwatch, which makes it a little bit awkward. So if you're listening to this and you're thinking, oh, I want to use that Overwatch tool, email me and talk to me first, because there's some stuff about Overwatch that I wish I had done differently, but I didn't. Uh, I didn't know what I was doing, because I'd never built one of these things before. So again, let me congratulate you for being a bro user. Um, the number of people who actually look at their networks is way too small. I think you guys are going to be the survivors. You guys are going to be the heroes who catch stuff, which is really cool, right? You're the ones who actually go in and say, look, I found this weird thing. And everybody else is going, what? Didn't ArcSight find it? No, ArcSight will never find it, right? Again, I'm just picking on ArcSight. It could be Strike, you know, it could be Counter-Strike, or it could be IBM Watson. I don't really care what, but they all have the same, they all have the same problem. So thank you very much. I don't know if I just went way over time, I think. So I don't think I'll field any questions unless, should I? Does anyone have any questions? No? Well, that's good. I left you all stunned in silence. All right, well, thank you. <laughs>